Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you to our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow Public Speaking and Presentations, to be analyzed with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and or microphone and or go to the LinkedIn live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by making comments and asking questions. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand, or turn on your microphone and say hi, and I'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guest is Dr. Mark Smutney, a nonprofit consultant, professional facilitator, and author of Thrive, The Facilitator's Guide to Radically Inclusive Meetings, the second edition of which was recently published and will be the focus of tonight's show. Mark, welcome. It's good to be with you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Mark, so tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got into your very particular field of work. Well, as you mentioned, I'm a nonprofit consultant. I primarily work with small and medium nonprofits who have a pain or a pinch on something. Usually it's because they have not, uh, they're, they're dysfunctional, they're conflicted, or they just need someone to help them with strategy. And so my company, Civic Reinventions, works with nonprofits to be more effective in an increasingly diverse world. The way I got into this business was through a lifetime of uh, leading and participating in meetings, many of which were just completely unproductive and did not engage and, in fact, bored the heck out of everyone. So about five years ago, a, a dear friend challenged me to write my practices and theory into a book, and it became a kind of giant business card for my, my business. And it's uh, really launched all kinds of connections because of that. Okay. And tell us a little bit. So um, why did you you write this book other than it being a challenge? And, and especially um, people don't make a second edition of a book unless it's been very successful. There's a demand or they're very passionate about it. So uh, tell us about this book, the idea behind it, and what you particularly like about it. Yeah, so, so for four decades... I've been fascinated by organizational practices that build inclusion. And in more recent years, when the diversity, equity, inclusion movement became to the forefront, particularly in the United States, um, I wanted to make a contribution to that. But being an older white Caucasian guy, um, I didn't have any expertise in anti-racism work, but I did have expertise in how to engage people in meetings. And so as a part of the inclusion movement, I said, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to take that lifetime of practices and put them down on paper so that it would benefit uh, particularly nonprofit leaders, but business leaders as well. Okay, so let's get right into it. We have our first online survey that I hope everyone will enjoy taking a part of. And the first question here is, why are meetings unproductive? And you can answer uh, different, um, as many as you want, I guess the options are. So the question is, why are meetings so unproductive and lack engagement? The first answer is only a few, few people speak while everyone else is silent. No one knows why they are there. Meeting participants seem aggressive. People who speak up are harshly judged. People can't see what is presented nor hear clearly what others say. People are too busy thinking about other things. People don't care about the meeting. People don't feel comfortable at the meeting. People, the meeting won't change anything anyways. So we have uh, still um, a few moments left to take this, to participate in this uh, survey. 
and we will get back to you about that as soon as everybody has participated. We have a few more people who could participate if they feel comfortable. Okay, and we will now close the poll. So there it is. So um, we have here that 100% uh, of the people wrote, uh, they agreed with that. Only a few people speak while everyone else is silent. And then also everyone agreed, people are too busy thinking about other things. And then please, please, uh, excuse me, not please, it should be people. People don't feel comfortable at the meeting. So there it is. Mark? Spot on. Um exactly why I wrote this book. So many meetings are dominated by a few, either the culturally dominant, uh, often men, um, extroverts, and that leaves out the introverts, the culturally less dominant, and, 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 and people that are not men. So uh, the, the, the design and, and the purpose of my book is to try to ameliorate that widespread phenomenon. Okay, so let's get right into our roundtable. After that, thank you very much to our participants for uh, participating in that survey. Now we will go right to our first roundtable. In the chapter, Meaningful Agendas, Mark writes, quote, the heart of every meeting is its issues or questions, its goals and a process to achieve those goals. The best meeting agendas have a logical sequence for each subject. Issue yields goal, yields process. I prefer to frame issues as questions that need answering. Listing agenda items as phrases instead of questions can result in confusion and ambiguity. Imagine a staff meeting in which items for discussion are listed on the agenda in the following way. One, workplace safety. Two, long-term employee celebration. Most of us have organized agenda items this way. The problem with the format is that it doesn't frame the issues in a meaningful way for discussion. Based on the information provided, participants have little idea from the agenda what they're expected to think about, discuss, and propose. The best meetings use open-ended questions in which the answer is not yet known. Notice the difference between the above agenda items and those listed below. One, how might our warehouses implement best safety practices in our industry by the end of the year? Two, what gifts shall we give to employees with 20 or more years with the company? If the goal is to brainstorm an issue, the agenda should say so and prescribe the process for how you will engage everyone. Two, what gifts shall we give to employees with 20 or more years at, with the company. As individuals, write down your ideas on a piece of paper, then share ideas in pairs. Next, share ideas in foursomes. Convene as a whole group and report the best ideas. Suppose you needed to write an invitation to a stakeholder summit to strengthen workplace safety in warehouses. Let's begin with a question and include the proposed meeting design. One, how might our warehouses implement the best safety practices in our industry by the end of the year? We will hold a 90-minute World Cafe of three 20-minute rounds, followed by a 30-minute harvest to discuss this question. The Human Resources Department will issue a summary of recommendations by 4 p.m. next Thursday, the 5th, end quote. So, Mark. What is an inclusive meeting? Why does a meeting's design make the meeting inclusive or exclusive? Well, let's go back to the typical meeting formats that we all have experienced. Typically facilitated discussion where the convener or chair uh, of, of the meeting uh, engages people around a particular topic and um, the skill of the facilitator is key to get everybody to participate. But when that doesn't happen, uh, 
and it's not explicit how people are to participate, the response often is how we answered the first survey, namely, some people dominate and, and others remain quiet and unengaged. So being explicit about how the design of the meeting engages people gives confidence for all people to participate. What we just saw was something called one, two, four, all. Okay, it's an example that's far improvement over brainstorming, uh, where you allow introverts uh, to write down their ideas uh, for a minute in silence, and then you form pairs, and pairs are inherently inclusive uh, because there's nowhere to hide, it's back and forth, uh, and then you meet in fours and compare ideas, sift through the ideas, notice similarities and uh, emerging trends, and then move into a whole group report. At that point, everybody's had a chance to speak their ideas, whereas in a facilitated uh, discussion or a PowerPoint presentation or uh, other kinds of lectures and those kinds of things, only a few are going to come forward with their ideas. So inclusive meetings are designed to engage all the participants in a meaningful way through particular structures that we put into our meetings. Okay, and Mark, tell us now a, a little bit, and please, if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to jump in. So tell us about then this meeting design in general. So this was the actually the very beginning because you are proposing then you're informing people what's gonna happen, how they're gonna go through it. Can you take us through the steps because you have a very logical and thorough checklist actually of exactly what needs to happen so it's uh, just like um, we know the beginning is going to be this. You're going to do that every time, and then you're going to do that. Tell, can you explain to us the different ways that this, uh, that the method that you have of holding yeah. any meeting? And I'll try to keep it really short because it could get a little long. So the first thing to do if you're responsible for the design of a meeting is to listen. Listen to your colleagues, the meeting participants, maybe a select few, in, in discerning what are the key issues that you want to approach. If it's a if it's a board meeting, uh, for example, there will be uh, there should be at least one strategic question on the agenda. So listening is the first step. The next step is to make sure that the heart of the meeting, when you're addressing the strategic question, is designed in such a way that it engages full participation. But before we do all of that, we also need to recognize that every meeting agenda needs to have some typical uh, components. And particularly in this digital age where so many of our meetings are online and where uh, relationship building can be uh, fairly limited, it's really important to build in at the beginning of the agenda some kind of exercise that just enables a little bit of socialization and a little bit of getting to know one another, knowing the space people are in. And that can be a, a, an icebreaker relevant to the agenda of the meeting. If it's a, if it's a group of engineers, as I've written, um, start out with an icebreaker that says, what was the coolest gadget you made when you were a, a kid? Um, and then share that in pairs and quads in the whole group. Uh, then you move into uh, the, the strategic questions. And again, it's very important as you think about that strategic question that you want the group to really reflect on how you will engage people beyond the typical facilitated discussion. Um, will you meet in pairs, quads, uh, and whole group, uh, and so forth. Uh, th that second place in the agenda of where you're addressing a, a central question is something that takes a lot of discipline, a lot of learning, and it's a lot more difficult than just listing a bunch of topics on an agenda and going through them one after the other. Okay, and can you tell us also now about um, some of the more difficult meetings that you have facilitated about specifically, I remember you were talking about uh, bicycle um, <laughs> bicycle um, hazard, hazards of riding a bicycle. Yeah in a city and how you were able to connect with these people and then connect also with the the other side. Tell us about how, how you use that method of getting people to um, to speak with one another, as you said. So the, in this case, then it would be, you know, tell us about your most dangerous, uh, the most dangerous time you've been on a bicycle. Yeah. 
So years ago, I was doing a consulting gig in Pasadena, California, and a couple of weeks before, a very loved city council member had been killed uh, on a major thoroughfare while he was riding his bike. And this uh, coalition of biking activists uh, gathered and they wanted to develop a strategy for getting the city to address the problem of speed and the absence of bike lanes on this particular thoroughfare. Uh, what the design that I used was called a World Cafe, uh, which is a, a, a wonderful method that's been around for probably 30 years, maybe 40 years, that has people meeting in a series of tables of four around a question. And the first question I asked was, uh, have you, uh, how have you been uh, 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 let me, let me put, let me try to remember this. Uh, it, share, share your experience where you felt unsafe when you were biking. Okay. So people in groups of four shared that. Um, and then, uh, three of the four got up, uh, and moved to another table. So all the tables of about 50 participants moved to other tables, shared the same question took a few minutes to address that each person shared and then they moved to a, a third round in a, around again cafe tables and then we reported out in, in the whole group uh, of in a popcorn style report what were your experiences of not feeling safe in the city of Pasadena well people just erupted into uh, a cacophony of experiences and it allowed people also to name how visceral the loss of the city council member was. And then our next round, another world cafe, was what strategic directions does the city of Pasadena need to take to improve biking safety in the city? Same format, world cafe, three rounds of people addressing that central question. And by the end of this two hour process, you had 50 people all highly engaged in shaping the parameters of a bicycling plan for the city of Pasadena. If it had only been facilitated discussion, the most verbal people would have asserted uh, how horrible the accident was, and they would have demanded that we have these kinds of solutions from the city, but it wouldn't have created the kind of whole group engagement and the strategic directions that then could be fleshed out with work plans in, in the coming weeks. So it sounds uh, like that um, the goal of these the objectives of these meetings is to get everybody feeling, and when you say engaged, you mean they're really giving their best. They're really, they are passionate about this. They are trying to solve something with the best ideas they have. They're really giving it their all. Can you tell us now, because those are clearly, um, I guess you could say low-hanging fruit because everybody can associate with that kind of danger or something. Tell us now about in a business context, what does, you know, you're maybe talking about buying a new photocopying machine or something. I'm not sure, but tell us then, how do you translate that? Is that the same goal you want to get these people all where they are all feeling like their voice is equally important and that they need to contribute their very best. Tell us about that in a less, how should I say, a less, um, uh, yeah, sexy uh, um, meeting topic. Okay, let's let's just say it's the annual meeting of a, a high tech company with two thousand employees, and this is an annual experience where everybody is together uh, in a big conference room, and you're, uh, the chief executive officer does this stellar keynote speech uh, that just inspires everyone. And then a break is taken for 15 minutes to get to the restrooms and to the coffee. Suddenly the room erupts into 2000 people having uh, individual conversations and pairs and, and threesomes and so forth, reacting to the CEO's keynote speech. Inclusive meeting designs that I promote capture those 2000 people in their conversations reacting to the strategic speech that the ceo just gave so so i'm interested in collective intelligence i'm, I'm interested not on just how the ceo is brilliant 
and has in mind the direction of the company, but I want to know how all 2,000 people respond and react and create in the midst of that. So uh, a high-tech company is losing market share, is um, uh, involved in, in, in significant layoffs, and now it's the annual meeting. How are we going to recover with innovation uh, in the context of the high-tech industry today. Get all 2,000 employees engaging in, other, in one another uh, on that strategic question, not just being inspired by the CEO, but having the collective intelligence of everybody. You're going to have more ownership, more creativity, and more collective brilliance than even the smartest CEO in the world. That's what I'm trying to capture. Okay. And what's been the reception generally when you have worked with management teams? Are they, um, have you had that response where they say, you know, well, we, we don't want those other people, you know, to have so much power. We don't want them to be so included. What, uh, what have, how have they reacted? And have you seen any over the past 20 years, have you seen um, businesses going in that direction? So, so, so part of the reaction can be to be threatened. Uh, when the head of an organization says, I'm going to allow the entire workforce to help set strategic direction, that can be very threatening to a board of directors and a CEO. Once they experience these alternative methods and the amount of energy, creativity, and innovation that can emerge, even from the frontline employees who may know more about the market than the CEO does, once they experience these kinds of processes that engage everyone, they become converted. But there's no doubt I've had plenty of times when I propose these inclusive meeting designs where it has threatened the people at the top of the food chain. So, but when they have then followed through and incorporated this, there was really, they didn't want to go back. They saw right. they saw the light, so to say. Yeah, I did a gig a few years ago for a nonprofit in the Seattle area, uh, it was a major refugee resettlement agency, a staff of 55 people uh, from all over the world. And they were trying to figure out how to um, uh, develop a organizational strategy for the next year and to engage all 50 employees in small groups and build intercultural understanding in the process led to incredible excitement, ownership, and buy-in. Um, so it works. Fantastic. So this leads us now to our second, our second uh, survey. Let's see if I can find it here somewhere. And the survey question is going to be, there it is. So the second survey is, does room setup help or hurt meetings? So the question again is, what room setups have you experienced that encourage inclusion, full participation? You can choose as many as you like. The first answer is audience seated in rows facing a presenter or a podium. Two, seated at a large round table. Three, seated at a large rectangular table. Four, seated at several small tables, five, audience seated in a semicircle in front of a presenter, and six, in a circle of chairs. So what room setups have you experienced that encourage inclusion and or full participation? Okay, so there we have it. The answers are a little bit all over the place. We have a seated at a large round table. We have seated at several small tables. We have audience seated in a semicircle in front of a presenter. And everybody chose a circle of chairs. Mark? Well, uh, we selected this particular issue because it's a good way to visualize how different table setups uh, in meetings, of whether they're huge meetings or the typical meeting that we have sit in every, every week, um, how, how the shape of the room 
and the distribution of the chairs and the, the design of the table can build either inclusion or exclusion. Let's let's go ahead and go to the slideshow on this one to illustrate. Um, so um, it's interesting that 100% of you said that small circles uh, facing one another engages people the most. Well, that's that's pretty evident. But how often do we go into the, the annual uh, strategy retreats, the annual meetings of businesses or or, or nonprofits uh, or congregations, and we see instead rows of chairs with a podium up front. This setup, you rarely get hotel conference uh, meeting staff to say, I want, I want cafe tables that seat only four to a table because it maximizes participation. But this is, as you all have intuited, probably the most engaging and inclusive table design as opposed to, next slide. This looks like it might be more inclusive. Let's just go back to those banquet tables. Okay, this looks like it might be more inclusive, but the problem if you're in a crowded room is that conversations are gonna prim primarily be side by side and not across the table. So this is less participatory than the cafe table that uh, showed you on the previous slide. Next slide. Typical boardman. Uh, boardroom shape. Uh, a, a board chair or president uh, sits at one end, uh, members of the board sit at the other, a recorder sits at the far end, and just the dynamics of this make it centered on the person at the head of the table. It doesn't mean that if the board chair isn't effective, they can get everybody to speak or she can get everybody to speak, but just the architecture of this table tends to reward the person at the head of the table and tends to dominate because of that. Next slide. Here's a typical uh, classroom setup, at least that that I experienced a long time ago, uh, where the expert uh, sits at the head and the passive recipient's um, face. Uh, this again doesn't do anything other than encourage during Q&A for the most aggressive to raise their hand and speak. It, it, it excludes the introverts, those less culturally dominant. Next slide. This is a little better in that it does direct uh, participants to look at each other, but it's still pretty heavily dominated by that head table, but it's an improvement. People are more likely to look at, at one another across the tables and not just at the head table. Next slide. This is a little better too. Um, this is a great format, I think, for a board meeting because you do have a chair or president of, of uh, our facilitator, but it enables the dynamics, at least in this meeting, for people to speak with each other across the way. Uh, again, I, it, it, it's not perfect, but it's an improvement over the rectangular long rectangular table. I think that's it, right? Next slide. That's it, Mark. That's it, yeah. So tell us now ab about these, um, why, just as we were speaking before about the design of the of the meeting, that this, that this physical layout is so important. And I mean, coming from my music background, I think about the design of uh, symphony halls, for instance. So you have the stage, of course, and then you have everybody, especially today, they put them in the dark who are just facing. So that's classroom style. And, and they don't get to see each other unless you have to move your neck <laughs> over or really make an effort. Whereas then with the older Baroque opera houses, they are in, a, in that semicircle formation. And the stage is actually uh, um, kind of you're looking directly at other people in the audience. The stage is, is to your uh, left or to your right hand side. But it's only one of the only it's um, the one of the uh, of the options. You can look at the stage if you want. If that's interesting, otherwise you're looking at everybody else. All the lights are there. Everyone's wearing their best and with their family in these uh, in these in these exclusive uh, little balconies. So tell us about that. And also we have a uh, a comment from Anthony Reichling, owner consultant at Reichling Quality with Strategy, and he writes. What about just a circle of chairs 
and a talking stick. <laughs> well, let me just address that. Uh, talking stick is a wonderful example of how power can be shared equitably and respectful listening can occur. And um, I actually have a technique I call gracious invitation that's written about in the book that is similar to using a talk talking stick. But the, the essence of the design is that um, it empowers everyone to both speak and invite the another to speak. Uh, that's what happens in Gracious Invitation. It works like this. Uh, a, a facilitator or convener begins and shares uh, their thoughts and then invites anyone else in the room to speak in the same way that a talking speak might be handed over. And that person has a choice. They can share, they can share for now, um, or they can pass, but they always have the responsibility and the right to invite anyone else in the group to speak. That's essentially what a talking stick does. And by democratizing who to select to speak next, the person who has the stick can invite anybody in the room. And, 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 and whether it's a talking stick or this gracious invitation technique, what I've experienced over and over and over again is that the most dominant people typically are only invited to be given the stick or invited to speak at the very end of things. Whereas in a typical facilitated discussion, they would dominate at the beginning. So a talking stick, stick in, in a circle um, uh, uh, is, is a wonderful way to uh, engage everyone and empower everyone in selecting who speaks and when. Fantastic. So. Let's move on now to our third roundtable, which is my favorite in, in the book. Why are language formulations so essential to inclusive meetings? So, so far we've, speak, we've spoken about formulating the invitation, formulating the, the question of the meeting, and now we're going to talk about how people interact with each other and the language formulations they use. In this chapter, quote, the basics of listening well, end quote, Mark writes, quote, one of the most frequently used listening skills is the act of reflecting to the speaker in your own words what you heard that person say. Paraphrase summarizes the speaker's content and verifies your initial understanding of what they want to communicate. Paraphrase has two components, the stem and the restatement of the speaker's content by using keywords or phrases, end quote. You continue about the skill of creative questions, writing, quote, creative questions are based on the content of what a speaker has said. They provide the listener with more information. With the right questions, a listener develops a more nuanced understanding of what is being communicated, end quote. So let's talk about that right away, Mark, and then we can go on to the other ones. But tell us about this paraphrase and, and how you do it, and then the creative questions. Well, uh, if you Google paraphrase or listening skills, the paraphrase is going to come up as the most common listening skill. It's sort of universally that recognized that when you reflect back what you just heard a speaker say, not necessarily using the exact words, but similar words to what the speaker used, it, it's a wonderful way for both the speaker and the listener to connect in a more uh, more deeply in a more profound way. Um, so it, it's really simple. Um, uh, the speaker makes a, a statement and you reflect back what that speaker said, not always using the exact words. And you can also add a question. Is that correct? Do I have that right? What would you add? So it's usually not used in isolation, the paraphrase, but often with a, a question or a perception check uh, as a tag on the end of the question. So Mark, can we do that? Uh, I'll I'll play the role of your wife and you play the role of Mark Smutney. So <laughs> sure. Mark, um, can you imagine, you know, I was looking for this gift for the kids and I went to three different stores, three different stores. Every time I went there, I asked them for this gift. Nobody had it. And can you imagine how stressful that is? Can you imagine how I feel? So, uh, Barbara, I understand you went to three stores uh, and you were looking for gifts and this was a frustrating experience. Am I right? 
Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. What's for dinner? <laughs> what? Let's go into the deeper listening skills that are in the chapter on listening well. And uh, I, I realize you're emceeing this, but I, those are the ones that are really critical. Because again, if you Google or put in your search engine listening skills, you're often not going to find the ones that are in the book that go deeper. And I, and and, and so I talked uh, about a few of them. Um, and uh, I was inspired um, in part because I do so much work that's intercultural and interracial in which there can be powerful feelings of anger and rage. And so often saw people that look like me get really defensive uh, and try to change the subject. Something that um, the word, the phrase white fragility tries to capture. And so I wanted to put in the book uh, the kind of listening skills that are helpful when dealing with deep, passionate criticism. And so there are about three skills that uh, I outline that are particularly helpful in the context of dealing with heavy criticism. Do, do you want me to go ahead and, and say a little bit By about those? Or? Okay. <laughs> You're the MC now. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so one is um, a, a really powerful skill called fogging, in which as, um, as a listener to criticism, a person makes a criticism. You, you, you haven't been picking up the dishes at night. A fog is a soft way of agreeing with the truth and what the critic is saying without compromising your own integrity. And it works like this. You're right, there are some nights I don't pick up the dishes. It's agreeing with the truth. Uh, uh, or um, an, another uh, listening skill is to coach your critic to be more specific in what the criticism is about. So often criticism comes in global, uh, wide sweeping assumptions. Uh, and uh, this technique um, enable coaches the critic, the listener coaches the critic to be more specific about the criticism. So an example would be, you have created a work environment that doesn't include uh, people of color as it should. And the listener says, help me understand how that's happened. Can you be more specific? And then they respond. Uh, these two techniques by themselves uh, are uh, incredibly helpful in uh, responding to criticism without becoming defensive. Fantastic. So again, so uh, with this fogging, we can do an example. So uh, you tell me, uh, Simeon, you're a, a terrible interviewer. And then I respond, well, Mark, yes, I could definitely improve my interviewing skills. Right. Notice that you haven't compromised your integrity, uh, but you have, in essence, disarmed the critic uh, to be more specific about what it is about your leadership skills as a, or your, your facilitator skills as an MC. Uh, so you actually are, are learning through the experience rather than becoming defensive. Mark, so then, oh, and how do I follow up then? Because the idea is actually, I know that the person is not necessarily going after what they say. I mean, I mean, what they say is not necessarily the substance of what they mean to communicate. And that's right. what I want to get at, right? Which is normally right. much uh, not so uh, wholesale. Right. So, so all of our communication is uh, conveyed in, in a certain level of abstraction. We, we rarely disclose fully what's going on inside as we listen. And so uh, the art of listening is in part the art of asking creative questions so that people dial down closer to the interior of what they really mean. So 
Uh, we, we inherently are more abstract when we feel less safe about our opinions and feelings. And using good listening skills help the speaker feel more safe and therefore more specific about the concern that's trying to be communicated. Okay, so again, another example, as I say, uh, I'm your wife and I say, Mark, you're a terrible husband. And then what do you respond? Well, that's a difficult one because I'm going to get defensive automatically on that. <laughs> um, it's true there are times that I haven't been a great husband. Um, what would you most want? Uh, could you think of an example that, uh, of a time when I really irritated you? Oh, yeah. Well, See, every, every Wednesday, I want you to do the dishes. Um, I, I, I would hope to be able to do it every Wednesday, um, but I, I'm not sure that I'm able to it right now. What, would, what, what is it about Wednesday nights that particularly annoy you? See, oh, I'm, coaching, right. I'm, coaching the, I'm coaching the critic to be more specific, to dial down, rather than making blanket statements. Um, it, it's very common for people uh, to say, you always, you never, uh, making these absolute claims. And the purpose of the listener to coach specificity is to dial down to what the real criticism is. Fantastic. So um, the other now... Um... This negative inquiry, can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that the, that's what we're talking about? That's, that's what we are. Yeah. It's, it's um, taking the content, listening for the content of the criticism, and then asking a question that helps uh, the speaker dial down into greater specificity. So I understand you're upset about the way I behave on Wednesday nights. What specifically would you like to improve? Me, have me approve. It's coaching the critic to teach the listener. Fantastic. And Mark, can you tell us now just a little bit more? Uh, maybe you'll be willing to tell us that a very personal story, as you tell many in the book, about going, uh, responding to the criticism of a, of, uh, excuse me, and Anthony Reichling writes, very important indeed to empathize. So can you tell us about this, this story where you were um, rejected. You offered, you offered your services to a company, and you worked really hard on the proposal. And they didn't give you the uh, the contract. And then you contacted them, and you did that. Tell us about right. that. Well, I, this was a this was a a, a bid to uh, facilitate a strategic planning process for a nonprofit in in the Los Angeles County, and um, I worked on it. I knew the nonprofit quite well. I, I worked on a very detailed proposal and I got rejected. And um, I decided that I would call the executive director up and ask Eric, can you name specifically why, uh, why my uh, proposal was not accepted? I'd, I'd like to learn from you. And he said, well, we loved your proposal, but the process that you proposed was not within the time frame." of the request for proposals. It would have taken us too long and we had an urgent deadline. And I said, okay, that's helpful. Is there anything else that I missed? And they said, no, that's that's basically it. If you had given us a more abbreviated timeline, you would have been rewarded with a contract. So there are times when uh, we haven't the foggiest idea why we are not successful in getting the business deal. And, uh, screw up the courage, call the decision maker and learn and get feedback. Uh, and again, turn your critic into your coach so that you can learn from the criticism. Fantastic. So uh, please, again, if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to speak up right in the chat room or turn on your microphone as we are going into our final minutes. So we have here... Um, at the moment, I, I wanted to ask you the last question about the story listening. So this is the kind of the most masterful way of communication. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so for 40 years, I was a pastor uh, in various Presbyterian congregations around the United States. And um, in that context, you do a lot of listening 
uh, to folks in times of crisis and transition. And um, besides being a parent of uh, two sons and working with colleagues and friends of all throughout, story listening is a, a pretty sophisticated listening skill where you're listening to sort of the archetypal themes that are encoded in a communication from another person. Um, and this is a listening skill that uh, takes a lot of life experience to get practiced at how to use it. But it basically recognizes that in all of our communication, these not so much the business meetings, but in, in, in other meetings where there's more attention to the emotional side of life, um, story listening is uh, listening to the speaker uh, of the underlying story that is encoded in their communication. Let me, let me give an example. I'll just pick one that happens to be real recent. I'm, I'm, dealing, I'm dealing with the transition of my 90 and 91 year old parents from their single family dwelling out in the country into a senior uh, living facility, which they don't really wanna go to. And one of the things that in, is encoded in my mother's language is a fear that she's going to go to a nursing home to die. That's what nursing homes are for. So I'm listening to the understory of my mom and I'm asking, what, what, is, the, what is the underlying even primitive story uh, there? And it's, it's a story that says, I'm afraid of dying. It's pretty obvious. Um, but if I hear that, then I'm more likely to say, mother, you're afraid that if you move, you will die right away. Am I right? And it zips right into the pain of that transition. There are times when organizations, nonprofits, businesses have collective stories that need to be listened to, stories of uh, creativity and innovation, stories of decline and dysfunction. And part of what I do when I meet with organizations that are trying to build a new future, a new strategic direction, is that you have to listen to the corporate stories that are embedded in the life of the organization. Um, stories like, we were really successful a long time ago when we were innovative, but we've been plateauing. And so the deep listener says, and what opportunities do you see to be innovative like you were 15 years ago when the business was founded? So story listening is a, is a sophisticated listening still where you're listening to the archetypes uh, in people's stories, either as individuals or in organizations. Fantastic. So uh, any questions? Anybody want to speak up? I'm sorry, I'm not uh, leaving a lot of time for people to jump in. Yes, Fred, sure. Frederick Mulligan. Yeah, so this is this is unrelated, but I want to mention that I, I'm, a, I'm a, an alumni of uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I just got the alumni bulletin, and um, I just thought it might be of interest to you, Mark. WPI and RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, have just received a four-year, $1.9 million grant from the National Science Foundation to design and implement a new algorithm-based uh, community collective ecosystem tool that nonprofits can use to uh, find and share resources. So just I can try to get this information to you somehow, but it just sounded like it was kind of right up your alley. And uh, uh, I, the faculty, the name of the faculty member is listed. Uh, so if that's of interest, I can I can find either through Simeon or Hugh directly tell you more about that. Well, I know RPI very well. Um, I, I was in Troy, New York for eight years and did a lot of consulting, never did any direct gigs with RPI professors, but certainly they participated in other activities that I was in. So yeah, that would be very helpful. At the end of the, of the session here, you'll see a link to my website and you can also send me an email uh, from that website. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to take a, a screenshot of the, it's just a one page article you know, it's touting what the schools are doing, but it does uh -huh. list the faculty member and, and the, the origin and the destination of the grant. 
I, I was going to, I returned down a job as planning commissioner uh, for the city of Troy. So I, I, um, I, I, RPI is a great organization as well as Worcester. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fred. So last question then, who can benefit from Thrive? So tell us, Mark, so what, what are we, um, we've talked about the inclusion, we've talked about all that. Is this a book only for business people? Is it a book for uh, spouses? Who, who can this book be useful for? Well, if we all add up the number of meetings that we've participated in our lifetimes, and then multiply that by the number of human beings on the globe, we've got trillions of meetings going on over the course of the year. So everybody that participates in meetings could benefit by the book. And I would say that's also true, not just of business meetings or nonprofit meetings, but family meetings, uh, community meetings. We all could benefit from more engaging, inclusive meetings that help collect and harvest the, 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 the collective intelligence of our groups that we participate in. And the old ways of running meetings just don't capture that. And so I think the book would definitely help. Okay, fantastic. Let's see how we can get the book. So here it is uh, available on Barnes and Noble. It, it, the book is called Thrive, and it's available for $16.99. Qualifies even for free shipping. So you can just go here to Barnes and Noble or Amazon. It's available just right in Thrive, Mark Smutney, and it will come. It will uh, appear. So here we have, I'll put this in the put this into the uh, chat room. There it is available. And let's see how we can stay in touch with Mark. So here is his page, Civic Reinventions. There it is. So Mark, for people to reach out to you, then all they have to do is they uh, they find your email some, somewhere here. Yeah, it's right down there. Uh, there it is. Right. Perfect. And I'll, there's my email right at the very so, bottom. Mark.smutney at civicreinventions.com. And people can reach out to you with their, their questions. Is that right, Mark? That's correct. Love to hear from you. Fantastic. So here again is his webpage, civicreinventions.com. Thank you so very much to Dr. Mark Smutney. It's great being together. Uh, make your meetings interesting and inclusive. <laughs> yes. So let's take a look at what's happening next week on Vienna Live. And the program is called Rochelle Johnson Living in an Amputated World. The evening before the operation, she sat alone on the floor of her living room, held her left leg in her hands, and silently said goodbye. The doctors had mentioned that after the operation, she might have some kind of phantom syndrome in which her young 20-year-old body would forget to remember that part of her was missing. A kind of tingling feeling might be left in place of her leg, they foresaw. What the doctors didn't anticipate were the screams of pain Rochelle would endure long after the operation. They continued to cry out in the days, weeks, and years thereafter. Her body struggled to accept the loss of her left leg. Since that evening, when she last held her leg, she has become a leading scholar of the environmental humanities and a fierce opponent of the industrial desecration of natural habitats. Professor Rochelle L. Johnson, Chair of Environmental Studies at the College of Idaho and President of the Thoreau Society, joins Vienna Live to talk about how the climate crisis is more than just the tingling response of an amputated biosphere. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmorrow.com. Again, that's uh, Rochelle Johnson living in an amputated world next Wednesday. I'd also like to point out that it's now possible to support the Vienna Live show by going to the website at simeonmorrow.com slash support, and you can make direct donations or one-time or monthly donations, and 100% uh, of all donations will be spent on the production of new shows, interviews, 
and social content. So again, please do generously support Vienna Live. Once again, thank you so very much to Dr. Mark Smutney. Thank you very much to Agnieszka and Benoit Rivolet for their support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From New London, New Hampshire and Seattle, Washington, goodbye and see you next Wednesday.